Thank you all so much for joining us today. We're going to be getting started shortly. Thank you all so much for joining us for today's webinar. And um, before we get started, I wanted to take a moment to tell you about some upcoming courses that we have scheduled. On Wednesday, December 2nd, Dr. Ellen Eisen will be presenting on job loss, suicide, and overdose, a case study on Michigan auto workers. On Tuesday, December 8th, we've partnered with Johns Hopkins Education and Research Center for Occupational Safety and Health to offer a free webinar on data, professional judgment, and modeling in occupational exposure assessment. And that'll be presented by Dr. Ramachandran. Our next ergonomics webinar is going to be on Wednesday, December 16th, with Dr. David Dufreit and Dr. Nate Bethke on fatigue in the workplace, effects of health and performance and measurement considerations in partnership with the University of Texas Health Science Center at Houston and University of Iowa. For more information, you can visit us at berkeley.edu backslash about CE. And thank you again for joining us. And we're going to be getting started in just a moment. On behalf of the Education and Research Centers throughout the country, we're pleased to present the Ergonomics Webinar Series. We offer free webinars the third Wednesday of each month. In this collaborative effort, on behalf of each ERC's continuing education program, aspires to provide access to current research supported through NIOSH ERC programs. We're really glad to have you here with us today. Today's webinar, Emerging Technologies, the Future of Ergonomics, is brought to you by the North Carolina Occupational Safety and Health Education Research Center, their Ergonomics Center, and Jeffrey Coyle. A few housekeeping items first. You're going to be muted during the presentation. If you'd like to ask a question, please enter it into the online Q&A. We'll save time at the end of the presentation to address questions. Any participant who is logged in with their registration email for the full live presentation today will receive a link to the recording and an evaluation form tomorrow at 12 p.m. Pacific time. This evaluation will qualify participants for a certificate of completion with one continuing education contact hour. Once the evaluation is completed, you'll be able to access and print your certificate. This presentation is being recorded and will be made available on the COEH Northern California's YouTube page and on our website, where you can also find recordings of the other ERC ergonomics and industrial hygiene webinars. At this time, it's my pleasure to introduce our presenter. Jeffrey Hoyle is CPE and Director of Ergonomic Services for the Ergonomic Center of North Carolina, part of NC State University at Riley. He specializes in helping companies optimize business performance through ergonomic services, such as comprehensive program development, ergonomics cultural growth and maturity, training at all levels, ergonomics analysis and implementation of practical solutions. He also serves as a research liaison between client companies and NCSU faculty and students on applied research projects. Thank you so much for being here today. We're looking forward to your presentation. Well, thank you, Michelle, and sorry for the pop-ups here. I'll try to get, get rid of those. Uh, just wanted to say thank you. Uh, thank you to NIOSH and all, um, all of the education research centers out there uh, and all the partners that we work with, and, and a special thanks to, uh, to UC Berkeley for, for helping organize and, and host uh, these webinars. Um, so I think whether you're in academia or, or in private industry or in government, uh, I hope you get something out of out of today. Um, I will say, even though I'm I'm employed by a university, I'm I'm really more of a practitioner than an academic, since we are are primarily an extension service that provides expertise to industry clients. Um, yet we also dabble some in in some applied research projects from uh, from time to time. And forgive my uh, background noise. Give me a second here. I'll just unplug my phone. Okay, and I'm going to take myself off of uh, off of the video conferencing. I'm sure you want to pay attention to the content, and you'll be taking copious notes throughout the uh, the duration here. So instead of looking at, at at me, so I'll stop video, and we'll get started here. So as far as the learning objectives uh, for today, uh, I think first I want you to to understand the limitations of traditional ergonomic practices and the methods that we use and 
and really some of the challenges in today's workplace. And I know many of you guys are already familiar with, with some of those challenges. Um, secondly, I think really the, the bulk of the presentation will be to highlight uh, some of these emerging technologies and how they're being used or, or can be used in ergonomics. Um, to me, this is a, a very exciting time in this field of, of ergonomics that, that hopefully we all love um, with all of these really disruptive technologies um, really being integrated into the workplace that I feel have, have really a great potential. Um, I really only have time to kind of wet your whistle with, with these, um, you know, during, during the segment that we have together today. Uh, so we'll talk to these at a, at a somewhat of a high level. And lastly, I'll, I'll kind of wrap up with summarizing how these emerging technologies are, I, you know, from my perspective as a practitioner, are shaping the future direction of ergonomics um, and kind of highlight some additional needs and considerations to further advance uh, our knowledge and capabilities um, moving forward. So hopefully that's uh, the same expectations that you guys have and, and that's what I've structured the presentation today on. So if we uh, jump right in here, um, traditional ergonomics, which I know many of you guys are aware you know, typically requires trained and, and somewhat skilled practitioners. So, you know, whether that's an internal or an external um, formally trained ergonomist or, or a consultant, or in some cases you may have internally trained resources such as, you know, ergonomic uh, subject matter experts, uh, or in many cases you may have cross-functional uh, ergonomics teams that have been trained and have really developed a, a unique skill set to basically go out and recognize, evaluate, and control ergonomic risks out there in the workplace. And there's nothing wrong with those with those capabilities, right? Uh, we train companies, you know, we work with companies to help them train those types of capabilities all the time. It's it's just not something everyone can innately do without having these trained skills to to some degree. So, and as many of you guys know, uh, the bulk of the ergonomic assessment tools that are out there, you know, tradi traditionally that have been used are, they're observation based, right? They, they rely somewhat on, on pen and paper, you know, the notes that we take. Um, and I think what we as humans see and measure at the time that we're doing the assessment. Um, and we know that humans are, are obviously are prone to error and, you know, and some of the work exposures may not always be accurate at the time that you're going out and doing your observation. So, you know, I think another limitation of these traditional methods is some level of subjectivity, right? Some, some level of subjectivity, some level of, of accuracy concern, you know, trying to choose the right posture uh, trying to use one of these force gauges maybe that you see here uh, or a, a grip dynamometer to estimate forces exerted by the workforce. And, and even on, on occasion, you know, the observation may, may even interrupt the worker, right? So now, um, now don't get me wrong, I, I think talking with workers is certainly critical, um, you know, to be able to find out what the problem is. And, and oftentimes they have the best solution ideas. So I think that part is still a necessity. And I'm not saying we deviate from that, but, you know, we may have to interrupt the worker to take some of the measurements. Let's say we're trying to do a, you know, a NIOSH lifting equation to assess the, the lifting related risk, right? We may have to stop the worker and, and take measurements of horizontal reach or take measurements of vertical height, et cetera. Um, and I think you guys all, all understand that. And, and then lastly, you know, the traditional approaches are, are fairly time intensive, right? So, you know, the, the observation of, of maybe a single job position, you know, we may spend an hour out there on site, you know, talking with him or her, uh, collecting video, right? Taking measurements. And then, and then on the back end, you may spend three hours, four hours, five hours to do a you know, to do a task analysis, uh, plug it into a screening tool, uh, perform any deep dive evaluations um, to analyze, you know, the tasks even further. 
And then you may have to do some research and brainstorming of solutions and, and documentation of a report, which is a lot of time, right? So it's, it's somewhat time intensive. Uh, and moving on here, here's an example of, of really a frame by frame video based postural analysis tool that may speed things up a little bit, but still as a practitioner, you still have to freeze frame the video and then rate various body part classifications um, for either the most common or, or the worst postures that, you're, uh, that you observe. So again, relatively time intensive. And you know, if you don't get a good camera angle, you're, you're basically estimating joint angle postures. And you, know, you can try to get out a protractor to make it more accurate. But again, there's still some level of subjectivity in, in this type of analysis. So can we do better, I guess, is the question. And, and to me, I think we can, and that's the, the direction that, that, that we're headed. Um, so the other thing I wanted to talk about before we get into these emerging technologies is the other challenges that I think many of us are facing in today's workforce uh, are some of the things that you're seeing here in this slide, right? So unless you're working on uh, a more traditional assembly line, or, or maybe you're in, if you're in the poultry processing industry, perhaps, <laughs> um, where it's more monotask, right? Single task uh, types of jobs. Overall, across the workplace, I think job and task complexity is, has certainly increased. You know, there's, there's fewer of these monotask jobs out there, many requiring work in, in very awkward postures, you know, confined spaces, restricted work areas, um, greater degrees of mobility required for jobs, you know, where some of the more traditional ergonomic solutions like your, you know, your lift table, your, your scissor lift cart, your, your overhead hoist, you know, may just, may not be very practical. Uh, and especially in industries like you're seeing here with construction and, you know, service and utilities, maintenance operations, aeronautics and shipbuilding, uh, just to name a few. So how can we address some of these challenges and issues? So first, basically jumping right in with, with exoskeletons, the first emerging technology that I just wanna highlight. Uh, and I know you guys heard from Dr. Sterling from University of Michigan. I think that was back in, in June of this year on the human factors of exoskeletons. And, and I think her talk was more around fit in particular. Um, so I won't get too much into that, um, that realm, but if, if you weren't aware, there is actually a standards organization um, called ASTM International, and they've actually established a subcommittee called F48. This is the, the Committee on Exoskeletons and Exosuits. I think it was established back in 2017. But essentially, they're tasked with developing consensus standards, and they define exoskeletons. And I know Dr. Sterling did this prior, but, but just to highlight it real quickly, it is basically a wearable device that augments, enables, assists, and or enhances motion, posture, or physical activity through some mechanical interaction with the body, right? And then they go on to say exosuits are, are basically the same thing, but primarily have soft and or elastic structures. And there's two, there's primarily two main types of exoskeletons. Um, and, and again, just, just real quickly, there's active and passive so again, as Dr. Sterling mentioned um, in, a, in a previous webinar, an active exoskeleton is powered. So it has either one or more actuators or electrical motors, really whereas a passive exo exoskeleton does not, right? It does not have any external power sources. So it may have some internal springs or, or cams with the ability to store energy, but no external power source. Um, and here you can see just a couple of them that, that are out there um, co in, in commercially available. There's uh, the Fortis, which is a passive device. That's the one that you see there on the, on the left, uh, which I like to call, this is used for more, more for industrial applications. And I like to call these uh, more like a, a mobile tool balancer, right, attached to the body. And then the one that you see there on the right, the Sarcos Guardian, this is actually an active or a powered device for the whole body and, and especially used for uh, manual material handling types of tasks. And I will say, I know pre-COVID, 
I, I know there were even some airline companies that were piloting even the Sarcos Guardian for some of their really heavy maintenance types of tasks, like you know changing big heavy tires. Uh, I'm not so sure now with with COVID going on, some of that pilot work might be uh, might be delayed. Um, but you know, to me, in, in looking at the body of knowledge, I, I think the uh, and some of the companies that are, are trying to adopt these, I think the jury is, is really still out there on whether these are considered an engineering control as a, a portable assistive device or whether it, you know, they're classified as, as PPE, you know, personal protective equipment. Um, but I will just say that some of the early adopter companies that are using this type of technology uh, in manufacturing, like your, you know, your Toyotas, your BMWs, your Boeing, your, your John Deere, they're essentially treating them as PPE, right? And instituting, instituting them for very specific job tasks. Um, and most of these devices are body part specific. So, um, you know, you have some that are assistive to the upper extremities, so the shoulders and the upper arms, others to the back, others to the legs. Um, some have integrated, you know, tool balancers that connect to the framework. So just to show you some others that are out there um, that are commercially available, uh, here you can see a variety of exoskeletons, and, and this is certainly not an exhaustive list by any means. Uh, if you look at the, the three that you see there on the left-hand side, these are all upper extremity exoskeletons um, that provide some added support to the shoulders and upper arms. Uh, I will say that the market certainly seems to have more companies with these upper extremity support exos, uh, certainly more again than, than just these three, um, but these three combined with uh, SUDEX, the one that you see there on the, um, the top right corner, um, they also have one called the shoulder X, which is for the upper extremity. So those four, again, that's just a handful of, of some of the more you know, well-known or research companies in this domain. Uh, the one that you see there in the middle, that Lievo V2, this is a, a chest and back support exoskeleton. I uh, will say SUDEX also has a, a chest and back support exo called the Back X. And then you see there the, the Nuni uh, Chairless Chair 2.0. That's a, that's a German company that makes a, yeah, what they call this chairless chair, which is basically uh, provides a wearable and mobile leg support. And then... Uh, I do know SUDEX also has a leg X that does the same thing. And then theirs is actually modular. So you can connect the shoulder X to the back X to the leg X and essentially have the whole body X, uh, which they call the, the max. And then just to point out the one that you see there on the bottom right corner, that BioServo Iron Hand, this is a Swedish company and really the only um, active, um, the only active exoskeleton that I've, um, that I've shown here on, on this particular page. It actually has a portable battery unit inside of a, of a backpack um, that's a soft exoskeleton for the hand. So it actually has these thin artificial tendons and a force sensor for each finger. So when the sensor actually activates, uh, motors from the power pack actually pull the tendons providing additional grip force so the human doesn't have to grip as hard. Uh, and, and by the way, I'm, I'm not endorsing any of these companies. It's not like I get any kind of kickbacks if, if you guys purchase these things. Uh, I'm really just you know sharing uh, from an educational standpoint some of the products that are out there on the market you know, with this presentation. And, and there's certainly others. So don't feel again like this is an exhaustive list. Uh, and I, I will just say that, that our organization with the center being part of NC State University, we, we have been involved with some short-term pilot projects uh, to test the usability and, and some of the impacts of these exoskeletons, uh, both in the you know, laboratory biomechanics testing, as well as um, out in the field doing some field testing, you know, again, for very specific applications with, you know, with some of our, our clients that we serve. But, but just to, from a big picture standpoint, as far as the body of, of knowledge, the body of evidence to date that, that at least I'm aware of, some of you guys are, you know, maybe more uh, subject matter experts than, than I am. But um, from what I've seen, exos are still a relatively new technology. You know, there, there has been some promising results that has been published on, 
you know, reduced muscle activity and, and increased uh, productivity for repetitive and or static overhead type of work. And there's even been some positive results on uh, reduced muscle activity and, and even spine loading while using some of the back support exoskeletons. And, and actually, I think you guys at UC Berkeley have even done some of those studies. Um, but other studies have, you know, have even shown the opposite. So again, from a big picture standpoint, um, you know, very application specific, um, you know, majority of these studies have had small sample sizes and, and some of these studies have, you know, have just used students as subjects, so not experienced employees. So still, I think there's a need to determine exact applications and really get more data, especially out in the field. Um, and we're certainly big believers. If you are an industry, we're, we're always, you know, recommending piloting um, you know, this exoskeleton technology before you do any type of large scale implementation. Uh, other things to consider with, with these, you know, can the task, can it essentially be fixed using a, a maybe a more traditional engineering control, you know, not something attached to, to, the, to the body, right, to the person? Um, that's one thing to consider. You know, you have to consider various sizing needs, you know, is it going to fit and accommodate your smallest uh, to your largest workers, right? And everybody in between, um, you know, other things, how much time is it gonna, is it gonna take to train your users on, on how to don, how to doff, how to properly adjust it to fit it? That's a big thing. And I know Dr. Sterling, you know, talk more at length about that topic. Um, how are you gonna use it? How is it, you know, what kind of acceptance is it gonna have? How breathable is it among your, your users, your population? And I think just human nature is, um, you know, people, I think, just don't necessarily want to wear something extra if they don't have to, right? So, you know, how are, how are employees going to, going to share? How are they going to clean? How are they going to maintain and store such devices? So, you know, long story short, I'm, I'm not trying to discourage you from piloting these. I, I'm still a believer that there's great potential there and we'll continue to see um, more in various applications and more companies start to adopt this technology, whether it's an in industry or medical purposes or military, but I'm just making you aware of some of the adoption challenges and that, you know, I guess from my standpoint, they're not an end all be all solution to everything, uh, at least not yet, right? Uh, and as far as moving on to wearable sensor technology, and, and we could be talking about things as simple as, you know, a Fitbit that measures heart rate and the number of steps that you take across the day uh, to more advanced technology that, that measures muscle activity uh, to other wearable sensors that even measure brain waves. Uh, this particular device that I'm showing you here uh, called the Lumo Lift, it's a very basic wearable sensor that allows you to set um, your target or neutral posture. And essentially anytime you deviate from that posture, whether you're in a seated position or a standing position, it provides some haptic feedback. So again, just gentle vibration to the user to remind you, you know, not to slouch, you know, sit up straight or, or not deviate from that targeted neutral posture that you're trying to, uh, tr you know, optimize your behavior for. So that's a, a really basic one, wearable sensor. Um, moving on to these, uh, these next ones, uh, you see three different um, you know, commercially available products here. And, and I think while all three of these companies really started out with using wearable sensor technology to really just understand the kinematics of the postures and movements of employees wearing these sensors, uh, really since COVID-19 came in, um, these guys have, have also integrated proximity and location sensors into their technology. So they can actually measure and track social distancing. And, you know, let's say, you know, two workers that come in, you know, closer contact than six feet apart, it provides that haptic feedback and tracks those uh, close encounters um, and provides those metrics across the course of the day. And, I know they're also using it for contact tracing as well to see who they've been exposed to between employees that have been wearing these types of sensors. So honestly, I think the pandemic's actually helped these companies probably with their sales. 
Uh, and as far as ergonomics goes, if we start with the one on the left, the kinetic device, this tracks some high risk postures. So, you know, different bending and, and twisting movements of the back. And then again, it provides that haptic feedback to the user. Uh, the module device that you see there in the middle it does the same thing, uh, but also classifies some other um, postures. So it can classify, you know, sitting, um, standing, walking, climbing, driving, and, and supposedly can even detect uh, some tripping, um, uh, you know, motions. And then if you look at the one on the far right, the strong arm device, it, it essentially does what the module device does. And then and then even goes another step further to detect some environmental factors like temperature, uh, humidity, air quality, barometric pressure, and, and even noise. Uh, and obviously each one of these has its own software and, and a dashboard for, for users as well as managers. Um, and to my knowledge, um, you know, all are doing some internal case studies with, with the clients that they serve, but I've yet to see a longitudinal study conducted by a third party, like a you know, like a university or a or an unbiased source that, and maybe that's underway. I'm just not aware of it. But again, I, I just haven't seen it uh, published quite yet. So I think that's another potential opportunity uh, coming down the pipeline. And this one I can, it's actually a video. So let me try to start this video and hopefully it, it shows. It might be a little bit choppy on your side and I, it, there's not really audio with this one. So I'll just kind of talk over it as it plays. But this company called um, uh, Xsense, let me turn off the, the audio. Um, it provides full body 3D motion tracking uh, technology using these wearable inertial sensors. Then you can get up to like set, uh, 17 wireless sensors uh, either fitted to these body straps that you see here, uh, or they can be embedded into these full body Lycra suits. And it provides some, some relatively accurate posture uh, data, joint angle data and motion kinematics. And, and there are studies on the validity of this type of technology that is published, uh, you know, to, to be used both in, in lab and field settings. I will say that that early on these inertial sensor systems were, you know, were somewhat subject to some magnetic interference of their signals, which obviously impacted some data accuracy. Uh, but supposedly, uh, this particular company, you know, has minimized this issue through some algorithms that they've developed. So again, it can be used while people are working around metal, which obviously occurs, you know, <laughs> out there in the field. Uh, especially with some of the, the challenging environments that we, that we talked about earlier. But this technology, as, as you kind of saw from the video that you saw here, it can be integrated with other uh, biomechanics and ergonomic software packages, such as the, the Siemens Jack software that you saw here, uh, or Viva Lab Ergo, and, and certainly even others. Um, so that's, again, that, that's kind of what you saw in, in this video clip here briefly. And if I move on to, uh, to this particular slide, if, if we look at the one on, on the left-hand side first, the Somaxis Cricket, um, which you can purchase anywhere from, from one up to four units per operating device. I think one thing I wanted to highlight about this one that makes this a, you know, somewhat unique is you can measure anything from muscle activity you know, with EMG to, to heart rhythm via you know, EKG, to even brain waves, uh, you know, via EEG through the same sensor. Um, and simultaneously, you can measure respiration and it, and it even has some inertial sensors built into it to measure uh, posture and movement information. Now, obviously, since you can only get four sensors for, you know, per operating unit, you know, you, you can't track whole body posture and kinematics uh, to date. And then if we look at that one on the right hand side that Norax and Portable Lab, it's essentially a biomechanics research lab in a box. It's kind of how it's described. And that can be used both in you know, a field setting or a laboratory setting. And I think it, you know, it can contain up to 16 channels of, of EMG that measures muscle activity, inertial sensors for joint angle and motion tracking, uh, where it, you know, it can display a virtual avatar through the software and, and you can track three dimensional movements. Um, and then it even comes with a camera-based system for 2D marker tracking. 
and then you can sync it with other uh, pressure sensors and force sensors within the software that 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 company has. So, um, you know, again, pretty neat uh, type of technology that's that's out there and, and still in development even. If we move on to the, the next one here with computer vision, um, just to, to really define it for the, the audience to start out with, and you know, it's really the field of artificial intelligence that enables um, computers and systems to derive really meaningful information from digital images or videos or other visual inputs, and then actually follows up and takes action based on that information, right? So I think the, uh, the saying goes, if, if artificial intelligence or, or AI enables computers to think, uh, computer vision enables them to see, observe, understand, and even react, which is, which is kind of exciting, but also maybe a little bit scary. Uh, you know, if you think about movies like the, you know, the Terminator or the Matrix, right? Uh, but as far as applications go, there, there are certainly a lot, and I, I think many more that come out every day. Um, you know, for example, if, if you have a newer iPhone, right, it, it uses computer vision technology in its facial recognition software, you know, to unlock your phone, right? Object detection, it basically does what it says it does, right? It detects a specific object within an image or within a video. Uh, many of your newer, you know, home security systems, it can detect a burglar. Right in the manufacturing type of a setting, it can detect uh, damages to equipment or, or damages to machinery that might need maintenance or might need servicing um, and can even trigger a response. Um, so whether that's may maybe ordering a new part or notifying a, a mechanic, it can do that within, within the, the system. Uh, and, and I'll share a couple of other examples as well. Um, object tracking. Right, this follows or tracks an object once it is detected and usually does that through some video feeds. So, you know, this type of technology is being used in, um, you know, anything from autonomous vehicles that, that need to track, you know, objects such as pedestrians and other cars and stoplights, you know, all in motion to try to avoid collisions and, and try to still obey the, the traffic laws. Uh, but as far as ergonomics goes, um, you know, one emerging technology using this computer vision is really to try to help automate the ergonomic assessment process. Uh, and I'll share, you know, a few different companies that have some commercially available products. If I can get this to transition here. <clears throat> and I'll just, um, again, not, not playing the, uh, the audio with this, but I'll just, I'll just start the video so you guys can sort of see it. Uh, and I will say all three of these companies that I'm gonna I'm gonna share with you are, are relatively recent startups. This this first one called Altius Analytics. So and what I guess what I mean by relatively recent. So within the last couple of years. So again, much of this technology and software are, are still in the development phases. Uh, for the most part, from a big picture standpoint, this first one provides some some 3D kinematic metrics like body coordinates and joint angles over time and since it has that, it can actually calculate some velocities and accelerations. Um, but as far as I'm, I'm aware, you know, from an ergonomic risk analysis standpoint, again, the latest that I understand is it's still in the process of trying to integrate, you know, some of the tools like the RULA analysis, which is a postural based tool for upper extremities, the NIOSH lifting equation, and an office based postural analysis tool. So those things are still in process with this one. If I move on to this, um, oops, excuse me, with this next one, and again, I'll just uh, I'll just start the video and, and talk over it. Uh, called Kinetica Labs, uh, this is yet another company that's a little further down in the road in, in terms of development, uh, and it's using computer vision to really partially automate both RULA and RIBA analysis tools, which are are certainly um, uh, you know, frequently used tools by ergonomists and, and, and by many uh, industrial practitioners. They're heavily postural based and, and it also uh, partially automates some elements of the NIOSH lift lifting equation. So basically you take a, you know, you take a video from your smartphone, you upload it into their cloud software, 
And then the software uses computer vision technology and artificial intelligence to automate the postural components of these assessments to really try to help you streamline that, that process. Um, and I guess the last that I heard, they're, they're still you know, working on Liberty Mutual man material handling guidelines to assess um, you know, lifting and lowering, pushing and pulling and carrying using that particular tool, again, also called the snook tables. And actually I just saw, I guess it was this past month uh, that Liberty Mutual Insurance has now worked with, with this particular company to develop an app that's used by Liberty Mutual risk control personnel to really help them automate their assessment process, again, using video and this software. So it's, it's really starting to be adopted. And this was a software company that started by uh, Dr. Lee, a professor out of uh, University of Michigan, obviously with the help of, of some others to, to try to develop this type of technology. So pretty exciting. And then this last one uh, called Tumiki, uh, again, very similar to Kinetica Labs. Uh, these were some, some graduates out of uh, Stanford University um, to develop this, this type of technology to, again, partially automate the, the same tools uh, thus far, RULA, RIBA, and the NIOSH lifting equation. And uh, I will say that, that our organization with the Ergonomic Center, we are, are currently doing some uh, pilot uh, beta testing of, of these, these uh, latter two that I shared with you, the Kinetica and the Tumiki, uh, to do some internal testing of the accuracy and, and the utility. So I can't speak to that as of yet. Uh, moving on to, uh, to this last one here with computer vision. This is a new one that, that one of my colleagues passed on to me uh, just a few weeks ago, a company called Swift Motion. Uh, evidently, they've come out with a, a recently created software used more for office type of ergonomic assessments using either images uh, and or video and supposedly has integrated RULA, RIBA and ROSA, which again are, are all primarily postural based um, or weighted toward po uh, postural assessment tools. And then moving on to the, the next emerging technology with uh, virtual reality and augmented reality. And, and you guys probably already know the differences here, but just real quick. Uh, so VR, virtual reality, really fully immerses a user into an alternative digital world or reality that's totally separate from the real world. Whereas augmented reality or AR uh, is technology that overlays digital information in the real world or displays it on real world elements. So, you know, one example of AR that you may not even have realized is when you go out and, and you're watching a football game, right? So that yellow first down marker line that's displayed on the field on your TV screen, that's actually a form of, of AR. Um, and then there's, there's certainly other companies that are, um, you know, that are adopting both of these technologies for certain applications. And, and I'll highlight just a few. Uh, but before I do that with the, the particular companies, from a broad sense, how is this technology being used and, and what are some of the benefits? Um, from an R&D side, you know, it's being used for virtual prototyping and, and design and, you know, being able to interact in virtual space with products before they're actually manufactured. Uh, which can certainly decrease the you know, design and development time. If you can get it right the first time with less risk to the end users, you know, it can certainly save you there, um, both time and, and cost. Oh, whoops, let me jump back here. Sorry about that. I'm getting trigger happy. Uh, and then on the manufacturing side, you know, I think not only can it be used to optimize like the, the assembly steps, uh, from a product design standpoint, it can also be used to design the layout and the equipment on the production floor, right? So that results in less risk to employees. You can actually simulate the job tasks in a virtual environment versus a real world environment, um, you know, where somebody may get injured. And then that applies both in manufacturing as well as on the service side. Um, it can also be used to display manufacturing or servicing steps and procedures visually and even display that on an object that you're working on to save time and money. So instead of maybe, you know, skimming through, you know, pages and pages of your work instruction document, 
you can actually have it displayed on the unit that you're working on to show you what's the next step in the process visually. Um, and obviously, you know, cycle time and the time to service that can be reduced, which, which all of these obviously result in, in money saved and, and more profit earned. So uh, this next one actually does have some audio. This is, um, uh, this is a video that, that Lockheed Martin has put out where they, they have this lab that integrates some of these technologies that, that we've been talking about that I, I felt like was, was kind of impressive. So I thought it'd be best just to, to hear it from those internal folks uh, rather, than, rather than just me trying to talk over it. So I'm gonna try to play the audio with this one. Hopefully it works on your side. The chill is absolutely amazing. This capability here is really used across the enterprise. We can bring a, an engineer or a technician into the lab and we can put on a head mounted display like the Oculus Rift. When they get in our motion capture system, they're literally sort of immersed in this virtual world, almost a holodeck per se. You can do virtual walk downs of the product. And when you can see it in 3D, as opposed to seeing it on a drawing, you catch things much faster and much more effectively. The scaled one-to-one, -one, so they're seeing the lifelike size uh, of the geometry. They can look for access and clearance issues. Um, and so it serves as a really uh, great way to, to validate what we're gonna do on the production floor before we actually do it. And one of the things that's really exciting is there's really two technologies here in the chill. One is the cave, where you can actually stand inside, in front of, top, bottom, anywhere around a real sized object and manipulate that object in 3D space. You can look for interferences, you can look for all kind of problems with the vehicle. And then in the motion capture area, we can actually become an avatar, step into the factory floor, if you will, run the procedures and the processes, look for interferences, but as an avatar in a virtual world. And there was a lot of collaboration that was going on between Space Systems Company and Aeronautics, who use it extensively through building the F-35 and F-22 aircraft. So a lot of collaboration, a lot of communication back and forth. And I think we brought the best set of capabilities and the best tools here in the chill. And today it's, it's being used across all the enterprise space systems company making every program better and easier to build. All of these things flowing through the digital tapestry across many industry sets are having profound impacts and we at Lockheed Martin are on the very leading edge of that. So again, you know, certainly companies are starting to use this type of technology and, and, and certainly universities are, are um, you know, are expanding our, our knowledge and the research related to this technology, um, you know, across multiple universities. So uh, I don't think that we're seeing the end of, of this. I think they were just in the infancy stages from, from my standpoint. Um, so, so here just highlighting a couple of other companies, you know, John Deere, one that you see there on the, on the left is another company using VR to optimize design of their tractors you know, to help them with the, the steps in the, the build or the manufacturing processes to check tooling, you know, check fasteners that are being used, the clearances in a virtual environment before it goes into production. You know, they can tweak the design to make sure that, that, that those um, out there on the manufacturing floor are, are accommodated and can do it with ease and, and the use of the proper tools. Uh, the one that you see there on the right there, uh, this is a European uh, VR tech company that creates uh, some of these VR tools used to help you do everything from optimize your workstation by displaying reach zones and, and letting you move things around in a virtual space to allow you to uh, virtually walk through the assembly steps all the way to laying out your equipment and workstations in the production floor so you can plan and optim op optimize before even having the, the tangible elements. And then just lastly, this, this is a particular article that highlights how, how augmented reality is, is being used in, in aeronautics and, and space exploration industries on the factory floor to help train their technicians, optimize workflows, again, show visual work instructions using this AR technology. Um, and there's a link to this article here. And, and you can see some pretty impressive results were, were at least reported in this, in this uh, article. And then here's just uh, one more uh, example of how it's being used in, in construction tasks uh, to visualize tasks, 
try to save time both on the training end as well as on the, the field work end, um, it, you know, even in the construction industry. And then lastly, with this, uh, this last, um, I guess, it, emerging technology topic that we're going to uh, talk about with, with advanced analytics, just to define it real quick, these are methods of analyzing data using sophisticated tools and computational power. I think that's the key word here to understand trends, patterns, and performance metrics. So we're, we're talking about things like data mining, machine learning, pattern matching, uh, correlation analysis, forecasting, just to name a few, but the key word is using computational power, right? And then predictive analytics is really a subdivision of advanced analytics that focuses on identification of future events or future outcomes and, and probabilities. So just kind of setting the stage with some of those definitions and in terms of how this technology is being used um, and at some of the benefits, it's really being used in, in sales forecasting to try to predict uh, trends in purchasing or the features that users like. Uh, but more specifically, I think with ergonomics is it's being used on the R&D side of products. So if you're able to collect data on product performance uh, or product failures or customer service complaints or even maintenance requests, um, you know, those types of issues can be resolved on the R&D side, right? And then in looking at the, um, if you look at those last two bullets in that top section with manufacturing and, and maintenance or service, uh, this tech can be used to analyze your injury data, your workers compensation data, right? Your, your near miss data. So if you, uh, you know, if you perform uh, behavioral uh, observations, which many companies I know do, you know, those observations, um, you know, could be used in an effort to make better predictions on what areas that you focus on, what root causes of the problems are causing these, uh, maybe the, the comp injury, um, you know, workers' comp injuries, the, the risks that are involved with those injuries, and even go the next step and give you some actionable in insights into how to mitigate those risks or those near misses or those behavioral issues. Uh, and I think the same thing applies with other business issues like your, you know, your bottleneck areas, your, your quality issues uh, that may require rework or, or extra maintenance. And I think we can all agree that obviously extra maintenance or extra we rework that that leads to ergonomic risks. So, you know, I think ultimately this is a tool that can that can tie a lot of these other technologies together with trying to make sense of the data whether it's coming from wearable sensors or com from computer vision to make better decision making to, to help you prioritize that will lead to improved employee well being, less injuries, greater efficiencies, and, and even higher uh, customer satisfaction. So, just a, a couple of uh, real quickly, I know I'm, I'm starting to run out of time here. I want to leave some, some time for questions, but uh, just to highlight a couple of examples of how companies are using advanced data analytics. The, the one that you see there on the left, I've included some links to, to two articles here. Uh, the one you see on the left is again in the aeronautics industry where they're using data analytics combined with 3D imaging technology to really streamline the, the diagnostics and the maintenance processes for its, for its F-35 and, and F-22 fighter planes all within a single system and that system technicians can interact with it. Um, the purchasing part is, is embedded into that same system to try to optimize you know, that process. So you know, if they can predict what part is gonna fail first through some of these predictive analytics, um, you know, that timeline is, is better understood. The, the automation of that ordering process can happen. Uh, you know, automation of the service request is embedded. So that helps minimize the, you know, the downtime of the aircraft. And all that information can be seen uh, and sent, you know, upstream to, to really improve future designs. Uh, and then the one that you see there on the right, this is a link to an, an article that discusses some essential technologies for construction risk management. Uh, it talks about mobile technology, wearables, but it also talks about 
the use of AI and machine learning, which is obviously part of data analytics that we're talking about here. And there's really a great five minute video at the link that you see here that describes how many of these um, technologies that we're talking about today uh, can be integrated together with the use of data analytics and machine learning to make sense of this data to again, you know, better identify and predict job site risks, uh, streamline the work tasks, try to improve work, uh, worker safety, and, and even try to uh, better meet some of the scheduling deadlines, which I think we all know and, and agree that, you know, that's, that's historically has been an issue within the construction industry as a whole. And I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I can um, I can actually send you guys some links. I've got a, a one pager that I worked up that has a, a number of articles and, and hyperlinks that maybe I can get with uh, the UC Berkeley folks to post that with this uh, webinar. But just kind of trying to wrap up here with uh, the future direction of the field uh, in terms of the trends that I see now and envision for the future, especially related to these disruptive or emerging technologies from a practitioner's perspective. Um, again, you know, being out in the field, working with a variety of companies, trying to keep our fingers on the pulse with, um, you know, with what's out there in the competition and, and trying to stay current with latest and greatest, you know, these, these trends emerge, right? So just in recapping, you know, I think we'll continue to see an increase in wearables uh, from an exo or assistive technology standpoint. Um, and especially in some of these challenging types of industries, whether it's construction or, um, you know, service and utilities where, you know, traditional ergo solutions may not be feasible. Um, I think we'll continue to see automation of ergonomic assessments with real time feedback, whether that's using some wearable sensors or using computer vision and, and 3D imaging. Um, I think we'll continue to see an increased use of VR and AR technology on the design side um, being used for training at, at really all levels, um, as well as being integrated within manufacturing to assess and, and try to control ergonomic risks and, and even performance issues. Um, and the same really with, with data analytics, right? To make more informed decisions based on data uh, and trying to automate some of those decisions and the last one, I guess, that we really didn't talk about that I just threw in here as, as kind of food for thought is collaborative robots, right? I think this is another emerging tech where, you know, employers are going to be working side by side with a robot to get jobs done. So, you know, I think as practitioners, we need to stay current and get involved with these technologies to keep people safe, to optimize our business processes for the company and, and and, and the folks that you guys lead. Um, and, and I know many of you work for, for great companies in and of, of yourselves. So um, I think with each one of these technologies, again, you know, we as practitioners within private, you know, within private industry, like many of you are, with the help of academia and, and even with the help of government, you know, I think we have to get involved with the needs to advance, advance us forward. So I think there's still a need for, for you know, additional validation testing you know, where are these exos, um, where can they be applied, what are they good for, and how can we standardize um, so that we can learn uh, across multiple studies and, and multiple in implementations of, of these wearables uh, with automation, you know, automated of ergonomic assessments. I think we'll, we'll start to see some newer um, ergonomic risk models being developed that that use these types of um, you know sensor technology, whether it's wearable sensors or computer vision, and trying to create more cumulative multifactorial exposures, not just looking at the the physical right, the biomechanical factors, but also integrating personal or individual factors into the risk model, as well as social and psychosocial factors, which we we all know, um, you know, all three of these things, the interaction of those three impact. Uh, exposure and, and impact risk to to employees. So I think we'll we'll see further development in, in those newer risk models. And then I think with with really the last three topics, I think across the board, I think there's still a need for development, uh, better understanding the applications for for those three those latter three 
emerging techs, uh, again, validation of, of where they're useful and maybe where they're not, standardization, and then obviously with, um, you know, with data analytics and, and even computer vision, you know, I, I think there's still some, some work that needs to be done around how do you, how do you protect that data, right, from a security standpoint? Uh, and how can we make this more accessible and, and, and cheaper where, you know, more and more companies can, can adopt it? So that's from a big picture standpoint where I kind of see the, the future of us going. And this is that one pager that I talked about, which so each one of these are hyperlinks. And, and maybe I can provide this to, um, to UC Berkeley that's posting this and, and they, can, they can put this on the, um, the website. All these are hyperlinks that will lead you to finding out more information. So hopefully that will be helpful for you. And that's really all I have. So uh, hopefully I gave you um, some tidbits of information that, that can be useful for you, but I'll kind of open things up for, for a little bit of q and I guess we don't have a ton of time, but it's about, I guess I have about six minutes until the top of the hour. <laughs> Thank you so much for such an engaging and interesting presentation. Um, some of the questions we have, just to kind of let everyone know, um, this presentation has been recorded and we will be putting it online. Um, you'll be able to find it on that main page where you registered on our website, in addition to all the links that were mentioned. Um, and um, it'll, it's also available on our YouTube page, which also has all the links to previously recorded webinars. And so you guys will get a link to that in your email as someone who attended today. Um, so we do have lots of great questions that have come through here. We'll do our best to get to as many as we can. Um, one of the first questions that we have, um, someone was wondering about which companies you might know of that embed distance tracking in their products. They understand it could be used for COVID, but it may also be useful for, for preventing struck by incidences on busy construction sites. Uh, and, and, and by distance, um, I, I'm assuming you're talking about distance between other workers. And, and I guess those three that I did share with you guys that have integrated proximity sensors into their technology. So that was, um, that was Kinetic, uh, Strongarm, and Module. Those three that I talked about earlier. And I guess I could jump to that slide. So as long as the employees are wearing those proximity sensors. It is my understanding. Let me see if I can jump back to that slide. It's way further up here. As long as the employ employees are wearing those, uh, wearing their, their technology, it, it does have um, that capability, at least that I'm aware of. So these three. And again, there, you know, there may be others that are out there besides just these three, but these are three that I'm aware of. Thank you. Um, do you know of any health tech companies that are, are using facial recognition? Health tech companies? Uh, I'll be honest with you. Um, I guess the, 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 the clients that we, that we have served historically haven't fallen into that field. So I, I really can't intelligently answer that question. I'm, I'm just not aware. I'm sure there are some that are using that type of technology. I'm just, I can't, I couldn't speak to it from personal uh, experience. Okay, thank you. Um, as a practitioner yourself, do you see on-site ergonomic services functioning in tandem or integrating with these types of technologies? Is there a new niche that needs or should be filled by practitioners? Yeah, I think that's a that's a great question. Um, I guess I, I see it as um, being integrated with with practitioners. I, I think uh, we all probably would agree that there is certainly room for improvement in terms of the analysis. You know, the traditional analysis that we kind of talked about previously, uh, just in the time that it takes. Um, so if we can use some of this newer technology to, to streamline that process so that we can spend more time on the solution side and validation of the solution using these technologies, which, you know, to me, I think we can use this technology to, to also get, uh, get some better data that we can present to, you know, senior leadership or executive leadership, those folks that control the purse strings um, to buy some of the 
uh, interventions that we're trying to implement and we can leverage this technology to do that. I guess I still see, um, you know, the, the, the need for that integration. So I, I don't think that this is gonna completely phase out ergonomic practitioners out there in the workplace. I think it's just gonna be another tool that we can use to expedite some parts of our process that, so that we can get more done and, um, and spend more time on the solution side of the spectrum versus the paralysis by analysis approach. Thank you. Well, I'm kind of thinking, I, I see this as kind of a continuation on that question. Someone was asking about if there are any sort of governing bodies that oversee the data collection specifically related to like exoskeletons and assisted technology um, and kind of assemble a body of peer reviewed literature to validate the technology. Uh, that's a that's another great question. So on the um, again mentioning you know going back to the uh, the the standard the standards organization for exoskeletons and, and trying to collectively put together the body of knowledge and, and standardize across exoskeletons. That's the ASTM International that subcommittee. Um, I'll be honest with you, I'm not aware of a you know another standards organization. Um, that oversees or tries to standardize data analytics, but there may be one. I'm just, again, um, I'm not, I guess I wouldn't claim to be a, a subject matter expert on, on that, that niche. So there may be some others on the call that, that could probably provide an answer better than I can, but I'm not aware of a governing body to try to standardize the, um, the protection of data and, and the data analytics side. I know being part of the university, anytime we're collecting data, if it involves human subjects, we have to go through a, you know, our institutional review board to make sure we're protecting the rights of the human subjects that are part of that study. And you know, that's a relatively lengthy process and, and we have to show a bunch of uh, you know, data security protocols that we're following to make sure that data is protected. But that's just from, you know, on the university side of, of the house. Thank you so much. And thank you again to everybody who's tuning in today. We have so many wonderful questions. And we do have time for one more. And just as a reminder, I'm going to be posting this um, recording. It'll be available on our website where you registered and including all of the links that were referenced during the presentation. Um, so our final question for today, um, someone was in regards to exoskeletons, they notice it's a challenge to fit these equipments to workers who may have varying anthropometric measures, and that could even lead to more musculoskeletal disorders. And do you have any recommendations or are you able to point to any findings about these types of issues in the field? Uh, I, I can speak, I guess, from, from my experience with, with doing some of the field testing and, and actually trying on some of these exoskeletons, whether that's uh, with some of the clients that we serve or, or being able to do it at, at some of the trade shows that I attend to, to try to stay current. Uh, the, the bulk of them are, um, especially the ones that I shared with you, they are adjustable and, and, and they did incorporate some anthropometric data into the development of them to try to accommodate the range, you know, the, the, the range of users that they're trying to design these things for. Uh, there are some others that have different sizes. So you may have to purchase like a, you know, a small vest or a medium sized vest or a large vest. Um, but but uh, a bulk of them are actually adjustable to, to try to accommodate, you know, the, the majority of the, the range of, of users. Uh, there, there have been some studies that have been done that have been published more around the, the fit of exoskeletons. And, um, you know, we, we could probably pull together some references uh, for, for those that are interested. I, I know that was something that Dr. Sterling, you, if you didn't go, if you didn't attend that webinar, I think that was the June webinar that she did. I know she talked at, at somewhat at, at length about the fit of exoskeletons. So that might be another good starting point to find out additional information. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for your time today. And thank you to our attendees for remaining engaged this entire time. Um, the Education Research Center Edu Ergonomics webinar series is the third Wednesday of each month, and the series is in addition to our ERC Industrial Hygiene webinar series, which takes place the second Tuesday of each month. 
Our next ergonomics webinar is going to be on Wednesday, December 16th with Dr. David Dufreit and Dr. Nate Bethke on fatigue in the workplace, effects of health and performance measurement considerations. And that's in partnership with the University of Texas Health Science Center in Houston and University of Iowa. You can be sure to check out our website for more information and to register for upcoming events at coeh.berkeley.edu backslash about CE. Thank you all so much again for joining us today. And thank you so much, Jeff. My pleasure. Thank you guys for the opportunity. Have a great rest of the week, everyone. Bye-bye.